If one were to consider the integument of uh, the vertebrates, uh, it would be reasonable to start off with the chordates, uh, which are the closest biological re uh, relatives of uh, the vertebrates. And if you were to say, look at this uh, uh, tunicate, uh, that was the larva, you'll notice that the epidermis is composed of epithelia, but only a single layer of cells. This is unlike the epithelia of vertebrates, where it is uh, a stratified epithelia composed of uh, many uh, layers. So that is a difference. However, there are similarities, such as the junctions uh, which form between these epithelial cells, junctions uh, such as uh, desmosomes, and then even uh, gap junctions and uh, tight junctions. And so uh, the epithelia uh, form this effective barrier by the junctions holding the cells together, but there's only a single layer of um, uh, of cuboidal uh, cells uh, here. Um, by the time we get to the uh, cephalochordates, uh, uh, we see that uh, there is a, a basement membrane which separates the epithelial uh, layer of the epidermis uh, from the connective tissue of the uh, dermis. Um, collagen is the most abundant protein in all animals, so it's not a surprise that this basement membrane is rich in collagen. Um, but then later vertebrates, including you know we humans, there is this basement membrane which separates the uh, epithelia composed uh, composing the epidermis uh, from uh, the connective tissue com uh, composing the dermis. Um, uh, by the jawless uh, fish, uh, there were some changes in the uh, epidermis in that now it is composed of stratified epithelia, many layers, uh, that there are glands associated with the uh, skin, uh, and even then in jawless fish, the hagfish are famous for the slime that they produce. So, you know, mucus uh, can uh, help uh, lower resistance as one swims through water, and so um, there are a number of glands associated with uh, the skin of jawless fish, and the protein keratin is made here. So this is significant because while there is keratin in the uh, epidermis of, uh, of fish, keratin will uh, then um, be used uh, in a greater extent for waterproofing in the vertebrates which live on land, and then uh, keratin will also then compose uh, hair, the scales of reptiles, um, feathers, and, uh, and other structures. Uh, so while the land vertebrates will use keratin to a much greater extent, uh, it does appear in the epidermis of uh, the jawless uh, fish. Uh, if one were to look at the um, a skin of a modern uh, bony fish, a teleost uh, fish. Uh, one sees that there is this epidermis. Notice that it is stratified. Uh, it's composed of many layers of cells. And notice that there are glands associated with the uh, uh, the skin. We'll see uh, better in a second. These glands tend to be rather simple. Um, uh, uh, made of uh, typically unicellular, very often making, once again, oils and mucus, which uh, make it uh, easier for the uh, fish to swim through the water with less resistance. I, I'm about to talk about fish scales. Um, and so here you can see the scales of a, a teleost a fish underneath it. They are coming from the dermis. So the epidermis composed of epithelia um, is not uh, composing the scale. So when we talk about uh, the scales of say a snake, that is of epidermal origin. So a teleost scale is made of dermal origin. And in fact, as we'll see later, the original scales had bone in them. And there is still bone uh, in the scales of fish, although it is highly modified. It has lost the original vascular portion of uh, bone. There are no longer cells in it, so it is a cellular bone. And uh, it uh, is no longer calcified uh, for the most part. And so uh, therefore it's primarily collagen. Uh, so that will make more sense uh, in a few minutes when uh, I go through the different types of 
fish uh, scales. And so here you can see that epidermis. Uh, once again, the outside of a fish is alive. These are living cells. Notice that they are stratified. Unlike my skin, where the outermost layers are dead and keratinized, um, these outermost cells do not die and become essentially bags of the waterproofing uh, keratin, although keratin is uh, uh, present here. Notice you can see, um, although some of that where uh, in you know, our mammalian skin as well, we have more cuboidal cells at the basal layer of the stratified epidermis and the cells become flattened, they become squamous as they uh, reach the, epic, uh, the apical portion. You can see that happening here as well. Here you can see some of those glands, but once again, they are simple glands compared to the multicellular glands with ducts that we will associate uh, with uh, mammalian uh, skin. Uh, so this is uh, the skin of a typical teleost uh, fish. Um, but let's return now to the question of scales. The first uh, vertebrates, the primitive uh, jawless fish uh, from uh, the Cambrian, and then also the jawless fish alive today, do not have scales. All right, so fish did not originally have scales. They simply had a, a, an integument uh, with uh, living epidermal cells, as we can see in uh, this uh, hagfish uh, today. There are no uh, scales here. Here's a lamprey uh, larva. The same is true. There's the lamprey uh, skin uh, there. Um, now, um, by the time uh, the Cambrian ended, apparently bone had been a uh, 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 tissue uh, uh, used in jawless uh, vertebrates. And then when we see the jawless fish of the Ordovician and later uh, periods, clearly they have bone. They have bone in their heads of dermal origin, but also their scales have bone of dermal origin. So the original scales had bone in them, um, including you know calcified bone with a vascular uh, layer. So we see this in uh, the jawless uh, fish, which were more advanced uh, than those which gave rise to the hagfish and lampreys. We see it in the primitive jawed fish, the placoderms. And then we see it in the most primitive uh, bony fish alive, um, uh, alive uh, today. Um, now, something of interest when we talk about uh, sharks, so both fossil and modern sharks, possessed what are known as placoid scales. In addition to uh, bone, what was then added were two additional tissues of the skeletal system. When we list the tissues of the skeletal system, uh, we think of you know, cartilage and bone, but there are others such as dentin, enamel of teeth, and the cementum which anchors them. Um, so these originally uh, came about with scales. Um, so if you were to look at a shark's skin, its uh, skin is not smooth. So I, I often ask my class, you know, you've touched a shark, you know, right? Uh, at an aquarium or somewhere. So it's slimy, right? And some students not, and then a few students like, no, it's not. No, it was rather raspy. It reminded me of sandpaper. Um, so that is because of these scales, which are called placoid scales. They have little barbs in them. And if a big shark were to, you know, brush against your skin, you could actually get, you know, the equivalent of, you know, road rash, where, you know, like if you were to fall off a bike, you know, just the, the rough, you know, sandpaper papery uh, surface rubbing against your skin. Um, so here you can see placoid scales from a living uh, shark. They preserve rather well. And so in the fossil record, you can find you know, these because they have these hard parts. But if you were to ask, what are the hard parts made of? The interesting uh, question is they actually are made of enamel and dentin. And you say, wait, that's weird. Isn't that tooth stuff? And the answer is yes. So the skin of a shark is covered by scales which are made of the same stuff of teeth. Is that a coincidence? No, the first uh, vertebrates lacked teeth. Hangfish and lampreys lack teeth. Primitive jawed fish known as placoderms lacked teeth. They just had sharp uh, bones in the jaw area. As far as we can tell, the first sharks lacked teeth. When teeth appear, all right, uh, this would be uh, the 
uh, cartilaginous fish are the most uh, primitive fish to have teeth. Um, they are made of this enamel and dentin. So it seems that the early fish did not have teeth, but they did have scales made of tooth stuff. And then the origin of teeth is that these um, scales made of tooth stuff, enamel and dentin, just got bigger. And those, you know, in the vicinity of the mouth got better at anchoring uh, you know, prey, they were already kind of pointy to uh, begin with. And so that the enamel and dentin, which we see in teeth, is the same as the enamel and dentin that you would see in the placoid scales of a shark. So here you see a sawfish where the uh, teeth come out to the side of the snout. From uh, the early jawed uh, vertebrates come the bony fish alive uh, today, and then that's worth some consideration. The Sarcopterygian fish, these are the ancestors of the amphibians and also um, the coelacanth and lungfish alive today. They took this ancestral type of scale, which had bone at the bottom, then enamel and dentin, and then they modified it. Um, and so when we look at the scales of the modern Sarcopterygian fish, they are different because the dentin layer is very thick, okay? And so originally this was called a cosmoid scale because it was thought that it was made of this unique substance, cosmine. It was later recognized that no, this is dentin. And going back to the original, you know, scales had uh, dentin from the dermis in them. And so um, the enamel layer is very thin. Uh, and so it is just a modification of that early uh, form. Um, the actinopterygian fish, they went the opposite direction. Rather than uh, a most prominent dentin layer, their layer is uh, most prominently enamel. And so if you were to take a primitive uh, actinopterygian fish, such as sturgeon or gar, um, so sturgeon in the first uh, image, a gar here, um, what you see are these scales are thick and white why are they white? Because they're made of tooth stuff. They're covered with enamel, with a dentin uh, underneath them, and a bone. So they are, are good as armor, um, but they tend to interlock and make fish less flexible. So the teleost fish, one of the things that um, they're known for is being far better swimmers, far better to maneuver than, say, a shark or one of these primitive uh, bony uh, fish. And the modification of the ancestral scales is that uh, the teleos fish no longer have this white enamel, nor the dentin, nor the vascular bone uh, that we see here in these scales. But this type of scale is called a ganoid scale. Uh, and once again, we see it in the primitive actinopterygian fish, where we have a thick layer of, um, uh, of uh, enamel. Um, from these primitive uh, actinopterygian fish evolve uh, the teleos, and the teleos uh, then lose the uh, enamel, lose the dentin, um, and then while the bone is retained, it's modified. The vascular layer of bone with blood vessels is lost. Um, there are no longer any cells in the bone, so it is now a cellular. And then the calcium is no longer deposited there, so it's primarily just uh, collagen. And so uh, the scales of the teleost fish, which first appear in the Triassic. So, you know, if we look at fish scales, uh, you know, the, the bone uh, of scales would have uh, originated by the end of the Cambrian. It's 300 million years later uh, that the first teleost fish uh, evolved. And um, the uh, uh, the teleost fish have these modified scales, uh, which among other things, makes them far more uh, flexible. Okay, and so uh, this is a little history of uh, fish uh, scales. And obviously vertebrates um, uh, were fish only for hundreds of uh, millions of years. And uh, so, uh, and uh, the fish are the most abundant uh, vertebrates alive today with fish outnumbering all of the tetrapods, uh, so this is significant. Uh, the teleost um, uh, scales uh, can be divided into um, uh, two kinds. The cycloid uh, scales, uh, which uh, lack 
Uh, they have a, a, a smooth uh, edge, as uh, you can uh, see here. So uh, smooth edges, uh, and that will be different. Uh, so, and this would be uh, what you might say fine in salmon or trout. Uh, these um, cycloid scales, the more common type of scale is a tenoid scale, which has a rough um, uh, toothed uh, edge. Uh, so these are tenoid scales, and so say sunfish and bass uh, and perch would have this type of a uh, tenoid uh, scale. Um, and once again, uh, these scales made them uh, more uh, flexible. Now, fish, you know, continue to evolve, and a number of uh, modern teleost fish have lost their scales all uh, together. Uh, so, for example, this eel has scaleless skin. Um, one of the advantages, it can actually do a little bit of respiration through its uh, skin the way, say, frogs do. Um, uh, while some catfish have very thick scales and are known as the armored catfish, um, many uh, catfish have lost uh, their scales and once again have a smooth uh, skin. Note here in this frog skin, there are no scales. So the type of scales that we find in fish are absent from uh, the land vertebrates. And in the next uh, video, I'll be talking about uh, the scales we find in uh, reptiles. Um, it should be said, however, that those uh, cosmoid scales of the Sarcopterygian fish did exist in early amphibians on their underside and then even early reptiles. So the type of scales present in fish ancestors of tetrapods were retained in early uh, at tetrapods and then later lost. Now, if we were to look at uh, human skin, which I'll get back to, the human epidermis is stratified. We see how many layers um, it has. Now, uh, to make an epithelium this thick is a problem because epithelia is a vascular. There's no blood supply. So how could you, you know, feed and sustain, you know, all of these cells if they don't have a blood uh, supply? Um, well, the answer is that uh, most of these cells are dead. So the outer skin of uh, a human, uh, while the basal layers of the epithelia contain living cells, which are dividing here at the stratum basal, um, by the time we get to around here, the cells are dying, and now they just become these thick interlocked uh, bags of keratin. So human uh, skin, uh, has an epidermal layer where the epithelia is stratified, um, but that uh, the apical cells are non-living. They are keratinized, dead cells full of uh, keratin. Um, but that was not uh, the condition of the original uh, tetrapods on land. Oh, and there's the dermis made of connective tissue. So if here you were to look at a frog, notice that the epithelium is stratified. Uh, so there's multiple layers here uh, that um, uh, the uh, outermost cells are flattened squamous, just as we see in humans, but we don't see that keratinization process. There's keratin in the skin, uh, but that these cells don't become dead interlocked bags of keratin forming a very uh, thick layer. One reason is that uh, frogs need to breathe through their skin. Their lungs don't work very well. Um, and so if the skin was uh, thick as it is in humans, uh, composed of non-living cells, uh, which are dry, uh, then uh, the, the diffusion of gases would not occur. Uh, underneath the epidermis composed of stratified squamous epithelium in the frog, uh, we see a dermis uh, composed of uh, connective tissue. Um, we also see that the glands of the uh, vertebrates um, begin to become more complex once on land. Uh, so there are mucus glands, there are poison glands in uh, frogs, and this can vary from frog group uh, to, you know, frog group. So the tree frogs might make, you know, different, you know, uh, skin secretions than the um, then the toads, uh, fro uh, frogs which live in desert environments, will make more of a wax which will prevent water loss, etc. Once again, here's uh, in human cells, the basal cells are cuboidal, the apical cells are squamous, and we uh, saw that in uh, the frog uh, as uh, well. Uh, and so uh, while we have this uh, dead outer layer of keratinized uh, epithelia, uh, on our uh, outer skin. Uh, the frog uh, 
uh, uh, cells are uh, living, uh, so they are um, squamous, um, but now uh, they can be kept moist and frogs can breathe through their skin, unlike uh, the condition uh, in uh, humans. Um, and so the uh, further keratinization of skin would then be a modification for life on land. So uh, amphibians are very still much tied to aquatic uh, environments and need water, uh, but it was the early amniotes that began to adapt better uh, to life on land, especially with their breathing. Once they got better at breathing and no longer needed to breathe through their skin, then they could develop things like scales, hair, and feathers. And also their skin could become thicker and keratinized because they didn't need to breathe through it. And keratin being uh, water uh, resistant, the outermost layer doesn't become entirely waterproof, but close. So very little water is lost through the epidermis uh, every day because of the dead interlocked uh, cells of uh, keratin, which make up the apical uh, portion. So as amniotes adapted better to land, uh, this was uh, then uh, a possibility. Now, in the epidermis, the majority of cells are what are called keratinocytes, the cells which make the keratin. Um, but there are other cells as well. The next most common group uh, are the melanocytes. Now, melanocytes are interesting because there's a embryonic tissue that only vertebrates have, and melanocytes are derived from it. So if you ask, how does the nervous system form? So here you see um, in uh, an embryo what's called um, the ectoderm. Some of the ectoderm will become skin and some of the ectoderm here in the middle will become the nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. The uh, nervous system uh, forms first as a flat plate. That's what's called the neural plate stage. And then it forms these folds, the neural fold stage. And then the folds uh, fuse to form the neural tube stage. And once again, this will become the brain and spinal cord. But there are cells just at the edge of uh, those uh, folds which are fusing to form the two. Those are called the neural crest cells. They are on the crest of the neural tube. And interestingly, only, not only do vertebrates have those only, uh, no other group has them, um, but there are a number of important uh, structures which are derived uh, from it, certainly in the head uh, region, uh, dorsal root ganglia around the spinal cord do, um, but melanocytes all come from neural crest cells. So this is a cell type that only vertebrates have. Uh, melanocytes uh, send out uh, long uh, processes and then can inject neighboring cells with melanin. And so if skin cells have melanin in them, it's not because skin cells make the melanin, but rather because these melanocytes you see here in brown are sending out these long spidery processes and injecting cells with, um, uh, with melanin. Um, and so um, uh, melanocytes uh, are uh, you know, very important. Uh, now in uh, mammals, they are primarily in the epidermis. Uh, so after being derived embryologically, that's where they go. Um, but in the frog, you can see that a great deal were in the dermis. And here we're looking at the skin of a lamprey. So notice the interesting shape of these melanocytes, you know, how much uh, they branch, um, uh, etc. Um, and no, so therefore melanocytes are known only in vertebrates, but they go back to the earliest vertebrates. Once again, here we can see them in the skin of a jawless uh, fish. You can see them sending out their uh, processes. Here you can see them in the skin of a salamander. Um, and so they can inject uh, uh, skin cells with uh, melanin, and that can affect pigmentation of the body. And obviously pigmentation has important roles in camouflage, in species recognition. So if they're a related species, the idea that, you know, they might look different, their pigmentation might vary, you know, can help, you know, them, you know, say in mating season, distinguish between one species and, uh, and uh, the next. And so uh, here you can see them uh, sending out, you know, those processes. And they're obviously doing this in three-dimensional space. So in a microscope, as you change the fine focus and you focus at different planes on your microscope slide, you will see that these are obviously uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, cells. Um, in uh, the frog, 
uh, a tissue. Uh, they are primarily in uh, the dermis. Once again, different from in humans where they're primarily in the epidermis. Although, you know, in humans, you can find them in other areas as well. So for example, in, um, uh, in the eye, not only in the iris, giving pigmentation there, but also in the vascular tunic of the eye where melanocytes absorb light. Here's a beautiful picture where you can see all the melanocytes uh, the melanosomes, the vesicles which have uh, melanin in them that can then be injected into neighboring cells. So this would be the skin of a, uh, a frog. Um, and then let me just jump down to in, uh, in humans, uh, here you can see they're located at the basal most layer of the uh, epithelium. So here's, uh, at the basal most layer. Um, and they don't necessarily look dark um, because the melanin is being accumulated in their neighbors. Their job is to inject melanin into the neighboring cells. So this is the epidermis made of epithelia. Here's the connective tissue beneath it. The base membrane separating the two would be here. So notice that um, the melanocytes are no located at the basal most layer and they are injecting cells primarily in the basal layer um, uh, with melanin and this melanin among other things uh, absorbs ultraviolet light and then is a protection from um, uh, from uh, cancer. Uh, and so um, uh, here you can see that the melanin is most concentrated in the uh, cells, uh, uh, the epidermal cells near the basal layer because that's where the melanocytes are injecting uh, the melanin, which makes sense because it's these basal layers, the cells that are dividing. Once cells get up to this point, they don't divide anymore. So the cells which are dividing and will be the source of the keratinocytes that you have throughout your life, obviously they're the ones that you want to protect from mutations um, so that uh, you don't uh, develop a skin cancer uh, later uh, in uh, life. Um, and so melanocytes are very important in humans. Uh, they have that very important uh, role. Um, but then obviously, once again, coloration is important for lots of reasons. So melanin uh, that contributes to skin color, hair color, the iris, uh, the uh, colors of uh, the eye, uh, this serves uh, multiple uh, uh, you know, purposes. And so once again, you know, in just as in one species, you can have you know, a, a, diff a different pigmentation pattern, you know, that can be true of, you know, groups within a species, different ethnic uh, groups can have variations in hair color and skin color and iris uh, uh, color. So here you can see the difference between um, an individual who has lightly pigmented skin and an individual who has more darkly pigmented skin. Um, all humans, uh, have about the same number of melanocytes. But one of the differences then becomes how active are these melanocytes? How much melanin do, uh, is made uh, that then gets injected into the cells and uh, then affects uh, pigmentation. One other uh, thing, and this is certainly very important, uh, but it's still kind of being worked out, is there are certainly advantages to having more melanin pigmentation in your skin, especially if you live near the equator because you need protection from ultraviolet light or else you're at a higher risk for skin cancer. And the humans who are at the, are at the highest risk of skin cancer are those who can't make the brown melanin. They have to be very careful. They burn very badly and um, uh, they have a higher risk of a skin cancer. But there are other factors to consider as well. We make vitamin D in our skin and vitamin D is very important. And if you have very darkly pigmented skin and now you live far from the equator, you're being exposed to less light in general, you're far from the equator. And so therefore it's possible that uh, you now have lower levels of vitamin D. And so then an advantage to having lighter skin is far from the equator, you would then be making more uh, vitamin D. So, um, you know, among the many uh, things which, uh, you know, influence uh, uh, pigmentation, um, you know, there's kind of a balance between ultraviolet light uh, protection and the ability to make enough vitamin D based on where, uh, where you live. I, I'm not going to go through it now, but um, I, I have uh, videos on the genetics of 
uh, of this. Uh, there are different types of melanin. There's the brown pelin, uh, melanin known as eumelanin, uh, which is brown to black. But then there's a more reddish type of melanin uh, known, as, known as pheomelanin. And there are then different genes uh, which then determine uh, which of these uh, forms is uh, is made to determine whether you know one has you know uh, darker browner skin hair and iris color uh, or lighter uh, skin and then even uh, in some cases uh, you know red if you're only making the uh, the phao uh, melanin. Um, there are uh, a few other types of uh, cells in the uh, epidermis. Uh, so while the epidermis is primarily the keratinocytes, maybe 90% in humans, melanocytes about 8%, there are also then what are called um, uh, uh, Merkel cells and Langerhan cells, Merkel cells contributing to touch, and then um, Langerhans as cells uh, functioning in the uh, innate immune system. Um, underneath the uh, dermis is, I, I'm sorry, underneath the epidermis, which is the superficial layer made of epithelia. So here uh, in human skin is the epidermis. Deep to that is the dermis, uh, which is connective tissue. Uh, you can see it's very uh, rich in uh, protein fibers, collagen uh, primarily. And we divide it into two layers, the papillary layer, uh, near the epidermis uh, is composed of areolar connective tissue, uh, while the deeper layer is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Um, you may notice that where the dermis meets the epidermis, it's not a flat junction. There are all of these ridges known as papilla. And so that's why this is known as the papillary layer of the dermis. And the reason is, if I were to put my finger on a surface and push, you know, there would be a force of shearing that would um, tend to tear the epidermis from the dermis. Certainly, I don't want that. So if they were just joined at a flat surface, that would be easy. But the fact that they're not, the fact that there are these ridges, these papilla, which join the epidermis and the dermis, mean that when I'm pushing you know, on something, my epidermis is not going to tear from my dermis. So you can see that in the papillary layer where we have that um, areolar uh, connective tissue. And then in the deeper layer um, known as the uh, reticular layer, this is where we have a dense uh, irregular connective tissue. It's called irregular because if you look at a tendon under the microscope, all of the collagen fibers are moving in the same direction. In contrast here, they're moving in all kinds of different directions. That's why it looks so disorganized. Collagen fibers can be running this way or this way or this way. Um, but that gives your uh, dermis strength. So if your skin is pulled in this direction, you've got fibers, you know, protecting there and offering uh, st a strength. If it gets pulled in this direction or this way or this way. So these collagen fibers going in all of these uh, different uh, directions, uh, these then uh, offer uh, protection uh, from um, uh, all of the, uh, from uh, forces in multiple uh, directions. This first video uh, is focusing on the cutaneous membrane, the layers of the skin uh, primarily, although obviously I went into scales as well, just given the importance of fish scales in early vertebrates. Uh, and accessory structures like hair, feathers, uh, and glands will be in the next video. But one last comment is um, our skin has two layers, an epidermis and a dermis. Underneath uh, the dermis is an area known as the hypodermis. So a hypodermic needle is aiming for the hypodermis. And here adipose uh, can uh, accumulate. Um, so here you can see an overweight uh, cat. And notice that once the skin is removed, you can see these vast areas of uh, of adipose, uh, which can uh, accumulate uh, here. Uh, this adipose is also influenced uh, by steroid hormones. Uh, so males and females can, you know, both males and females both make estrogen and testosterone, but the levels of each can vary. And so um, these uh, hormones, among other things, affect where adipose is deposited in the body. So uh, males and females can both put um, 
adipose tissue in the hypodermis, but where exactly in the uh, hypodermis uh, can uh, vary between uh, males and females. And thus, uh, this can be called what's, uh, what's called a secondary sexual characteristic. It can be a difference between the genders, but not one directly related to, uh, uh, to reproduction, but rather just you know, a byproduct of the action of those hormones. So this has been an introduction into both fish scales and then the layers of the cutaneous uh, membrane of the integument. Uh, and this, uh, the next video will be on the accessory structures of the integument.